Well, good morning, church. We are back online. Our building closed for this Sunday and next. This service is recorded on, has been recorded on Thursday evening. I am in an empty building, apart from three sound and vision folk, to whom I'm very thankful for. Parts of the service were recorded too after church on Sunday, some of the music. And then some you will see that some has been recorded in people's homes. But look, we've been here before, and you've been there before. So from the comfort of your own home, whether you're on your own or you're with the people you love, let us worship God together as First Antrim Presbyterian Church family. And if you do happen to be looking in as a guest today, you are most welcome. And may God bless you as you worship along with us. And we do worship in Jesus' name. We're praising God. We're hearing his word, his spirit encouraging us to live for Jesus, praying that God's love would spill over from our lives, that others might experience his transforming grace. Well, look, as we worship, let's speak God's word together. The words will come up on the screen. So please say with me as we worship, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And now would you join with me in speaking the words of a hymn, and again the words will appear on your screen, words which will help us worship God trustingly as we pray. So speak with me as we worship, as we pray, Father of heaven, whose love profound, a ransom for our souls has found, before your throne we sinners bend, to us your pardoning love extend. Almighty Son, incarnate Word, our prophet, priest, redeemer, Lord, before your throne we sinners bend, to us your saving grace extend. Eternal Spirit, by whose breath the soul is raised from sin and death, before your throne we sinners bend, to us your quickening power extend. Jehovah, Father, Spirit, Son, Mysterious Godhead, three in one. Before your throne, we sinners bend. Grace, pardon, life to us extend. Amen. And so, God, beyond all praising, we do worship you today. We sing the love amazing that songs cannot repay. For we can only wonder at every gift you send, at blessings without number and mercies without end. And so we lift our hearts before you and wait upon your word. We honor and adore you, our great and mighty Lord. Then here, O gracious Savior, accept the love we bring, that we who know your favor may serve you as our King. And whether our tomorrows be filled with good or ill, we'll triumph through our sorrows and rise to bless you still, to marvel at your beauty, to glory in your ways, and make a joyful duty our sacrifice of praise. Well, please join in with Leah and Chloe and Joel as they lead us in the Lord's Prayer. And then please join in with our musicians and singers as you sing um, with them, as it were, to God be the glory.
Well, go and um, find a Bible. Hopefully you have one handy. And look up the Old Testament and Isaiah chapter 9. Look up Isaiah chapter 9. Now, Caitlin is going to read this for us. But those who are a little bit younger, as she reads, if you're following along or listening in, I want you to listen out for the phrase or two words. Wonderful counselor. And then as you come across it, as you hear her read it, um, shout out and find it. So thanks, Caitlin. Isaiah 9. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you, as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be the fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. For the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness for that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Essential, essential. It's one of those words in public discourse in the public eye as never before due to COVID-19. Essential workers, essential travel, essential retail and so on. Now when it comes to Christmas, what do you consider essential? What do you consider essential uh, when it comes to Christmas? We've even had to think about that in ways never before anticipated. Well, it's essential we have a tree, it's essential we have turkey, but now who are the people? It is essential we bubble with this Christmas. Well, I'm going to get straight to the point. When it comes to Christmas, Jesus is essential, and absolutely so. Essential to the meaning of Christmas as much as he is essential to the impact upon our lives once the holiday passes and we move on with our lives. Essential to such focus and conclusion is the Bible section. And Caitlin read for us a few moments ago, Isaiah 9, and in particular 6 and 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be in his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Centuries before Jesus was born, Isaiah saw him coming and prophesied just how absolutely essential he would be, encapsulated by those names and titles which would sum up the character and declare the person. Jesus is essential, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. You begin to get Jesus through such, and see that he is indeed essential. And so, such essential realities will keep us going over these next four Sundays, whether we're in this building or at home or however these next Sundays work out. But this morning then, Jesus is essential, wonderful counselor. Now, if you're a little bit younger and you're listening in, okay, you will be able to download, oh, you will be able to download this. I don't know whether you can see this. Jesus' wonderful counselor coloring sheet, okay? From the information, I hope that will have gone out on the, on the what, church WhatsApp group and email. And what I want you to do, at least before Wednesday, okay? If you color it in, take a photo, photo of yourself with it and send it to me and by Wednesday evening, and then we'll show it for all to see next Sunday, okay? So something to do for the next, well, something to do maybe this afternoon, a bit of coloring. So Jesus is essential, wonderful counselor. 
Wonderful. Ah, already the Christmas spirit. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Or it's a wonderful life, the, the film. In the Bible's original language, the word we have translated here as wonderful is the nearest that language could get to supernatural, almost exclusively used of the things only God can do beyond human capability. Such would be conveyed later on in the book of Isaiah as the prophet speaks of the Lord Almighty, wonderful in counsel and magnificent in wisdom. And you can check that out in 28, chapter 28 and sentence number 29. So this divine counselor will instruct with the wisdom that comes only from God. This counselor has extraordinary supernatural breathtaking wisdom to plan and to govern and to execute policy. Well, we could do with him, couldn't we? Yes, counselor. In recent days, we've been made very much aware of counselors at the heart of government with ideas and strategies for the country, advising the prime minister. Initially, I suppose, where Brexit was concerned, and then, of course, through COVID-19. Not so much a wonderful counselor in some people's eyes. But constantly, constantly, we are on the receiving advice and counsel from our leaders by way of a strategy to bring us and help us through a global pandemic. And it is a struggle for them on various levels to give such advice as much as it is for us to receive such counsel. However, if you glance down at verse 2, of chapter 9 here in Isaiah. The original setting of Isaiah's prophecy feels very much like our own day. These days it really does feel like we are a people walking in darkness and very much living in the land of the shadow of death. Our nation seems to be teetering on a catastrophic nervous breakdown as we draw in that particular aspect of counseling. Of course, there is light at the end of the tunnel, a vaccine on the way. However, the reality is this. COVID-19 or not, darkness and death pervades our world. It grips our society. It characterizes our culture and is fundamentally rooted in your heart and mine. Even if you glance back to the end of Isaiah chapter 8 and verses 19 to 22, it talks about a spiritual crisis, a, a, a spiritual darkness, a rejection of God and his word. And therefore, as it says in, in verses 20, 22 or whatever, it says, look, whether people look up or whether people look down, it's dark, utter darkness. You see, in the Bible, um, the picture of darkness means being ignorant of God it is also where in our rebellion against God, we hide to keep our lives hidden from God. We shudder at the thought our lives are exposed to the clear light of day. And darkness speaks of being under a death sentence. It's a cold, gripping, terrifying shadow. All of us have a certain number of heartbeats left. Oh, there you go. There's a few less now. Um, every beat edging you closer to that time when you will die. But don't you love the opening word of Isaiah chapter 9? Nevertheless, nevertheless, light is on the way. A great light seen, light has dawned. People obviously can't sort out things for themselves. Desperate times require the most dramatic of solutions, and God has it. And Isaiah announces it. A child born, a son given. Unexpected, but good news. Here the mystery of the incarnation is anticipated. That unique event in which God took on flesh. God became human. The child born, the son given. Jesus, the incarnate son of God. Wonderful counselor. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. If you want to hear God speak, listen to Jesus' words. And so the opening words in John's gospel, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. 
In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And John, in his gospel, records for us the occasion when Jesus himself stood up and declared, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is wonderful. Not merely someone extraordinary, but someone who in his very person and being is a wonder, surpassing human thought and power, God himself. Therefore, Jesus is uniquely qualified to be the wonderful counselor, absolutely essential for us. Essential because Jesus has an insight into our hearts that no one else has, not even ourselves. He knows how we're wired. He knows how we're motivated. As you read the Gospels, you see how people were amazed, how Jesus was able to put his finger precisely and immediately on what was going on in someone's heart and experience. And essential that in knowing you personally, Jesus understands your needs. I mean, remember Christmas? He stepped foot in this dark world experienced its mess, walked in our shoes, seen it all, tempted at every level, lived our life, died our death. Therefore, compassionate and sympathetic like no one else, the only one able to say with any degree of honesty, I know how you feel. Essential because Jesus is able to diagnose your problem and my problem. We tend to see only the surface problems and even then barely able to scratch the surface. Jesus knows the heart of the problem, which is the problem of the human heart. We fight God for the right to be in charge of our God-given life, the life he gives us in the first place. We want to have the final say. We want to have the last word in our life. Jesus is the wonderful counselor, telling the truth about ourselves and about our world. His diagnosis rings true when you listen to him. Essential because not only does Jesus diagnose you properly, but delivers you powerfully. Because he succeeded where we failed. He lived the life we can't. He was wronged against. He was let down by friends. He was treated unjustly, but not a sinful bone in his body. Never bitter, never unforgiving, selfish. Jesus truly can help us. Wonderful counselor. And such is his promise to the Christian believer by his Holy Spirit, another counselor, another helper, to live in us. You see, Jesus is essential because he acted to rescue us. I suppose to some degree, counseling requires distance, not getting involved, the, the importance of boundaries. But not this wonderful counselor. He gave all of himself for us. The greatest act of love in history, the death of the incarnate Son of God in the place of sinners like us. The wisdom of God ultimately, uniquely revealed in Jesus himself, the crucified, risen, and reigning Lord. Jesus is Lord. And therefore we can trust him, the wonderful counselor, Comfort in dark days and dysfunctional times. He knows all the facts, all the facts from beginning to end. Whether that be at the level of our molecules and cells or in the, the grand picture of space and time and, and history. Compares to us. Compared to us, he sees the whole picture. And so whatever's going on, he's got it. He really does. And the name Wonderful Counselor helps you get Jesus. Jesus is essential. So have you taken, will you take his counsel? Neutrality isn't really an option when you're confronted with someone like Jesus. Sure, it's not. Either what I've just been saying is true or it's not. I mean, a counselor will come up with the best ideas and the best strategies and solutions so as to help you. Isn't that right? So let me ask you, what is yours? What are your ideas and strategies for dealing with the darkness as we've been so thinking? You're not really that wonderful, are you? 
So this is where you've got to pause and take on board that little sentence in Isaiah 9 and, and verse 6. Look, glance down. And the government will be on his shoulders. I mean, do you feel like the world is on your shoulders? So give it up. Stop thinking you're in charge. Being the supreme ruler of your life is a heavy burden which you were never meant to carry, never meant to bear. None of us can carry the world on our shoulders. None of us can face the darkness on our own. But Jesus is wonderful counselor. He's got it. He's got the government. He is Lord. Well, we'll hear, maybe even sing, this carol in the coming weeks. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep the silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. The hopes and fears of all the years. Jesus, wonderful counselor, he's got it. Well, once more, um, why not sing along with those leading the praise today as we worship, using the words of the hymn, Faithful One, and then pray along with Harry McFadden as he leads us.
Let us pray. Almighty God, everlasting Father, we thank you that even though restrictions prevent us from gathering together as a fellowship in one place, nothing can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the technology that allows us to enjoy this time of virtual corporate worship, to listen to your word and have Stephen teach from it, to appreciate both the music and the lyrics of hymns old and new, and in the confinement of our homes, the freedom to sing along in praise of your holy name. We do thank you for those within the fellowship who give of their time and talents to bring all this together, music, sound, vision. Help us always to appreciate how their efforts enable us as a congregation to join in our worship for you, for your honour and your glory. We pray for Stephen as he seeks to teach from your word week by week. Lord, we share in his sense of frustration as these prolonged but necessary restrictions curtail many of the usual channels for the provision of outreach and pastoral care. We ask, Lord, that you continue to sustain him and the man's family at this time and that as many regular doors remain closed, other alternative doors would open, enabling your word and your wonderful love to shine in this town and beyond. Today, Lord, we would lift before you family, friends and the members of this fellowship for whom this pandemic has raised their worries and concerns to a whole new level. Many experience loneliness, limited access to family, hospital appointments postponed, uncertainty regarding employment or education and much, much more. Help us, whether as individuals or as a fellowship, to be aware of the needs and concerns of others. And as far as is possible, may we offer such support as may be appropriate. Lord God, we would ask that your tender loving care would surround and sustain all who continue to work in order that the rest of us may be able to continue with our lives as normally as is possible. We pray particularly for all engaged in the health and social care sector. We do thank you for each one of them. Be with them and keep them strong physically, mentally and spiritually in these most demanding of times. We pray for our government both in London and at Stormont. Be especially close to Robin Swan in his role as health minister. Guide him and those who advise him as he looks to carry with him an oft times diverse executive as to how best to minimise and defeat the effects of this virus. As the world around us closes in and we become somewhat overwhelmed by rules and regulations, statistics, graphs and weekly averages, help us to lift our eyes heavenward to you, Almighty God, Jehovah Jireh. Sovereign Lord, in our weakness we look to you for strength. In our fearfulness we look to you for courage. In our sadness we look to you for comfort. In our confusion, we look to you for clarity. And in our doubting, we look to you for certainty. Heavenly Father, as we move towards December, we become increasingly more focused on Christmas. And while some become fixated on the commercial and social aspects of the season, may we always remember that this is the time when we as your children celebrate the birth of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. In what is likely to be a muted Christmas for many, may our worship sound long and loud. In darkness we look to you for light. In your death we look to you for light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you, Harry. Well, this Sunday we were meant to celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Um, we will aim instead, um, God willing, for Sunday the 31st of January and then the Wednesday evening following, okay, 3rd of February. By way of Christmas morning, there will be no um, service. Um, however, we plan to put together, we're going to put together something pre-recorded for that occasion. Now, listen carefully. What I want you to do, what I'd love you to do, is by Sunday the 13th of December, record yourself saying Happy Christmas from, and then send that clip 
via the WhatsApp to the, by WhatsApp to the church mobile number um, or church office email, okay? If you don't want to send a video clip, then why not a photograph and, well, you can hold up a piece of paper saying, Happy Christmas. Um, if none of this technology works for you, um, phone the church office, leave your name, and I will read out your name by way of a Happy Christmas. Now, if you don't have access to a phone even, um, we will send you out one of the carrier pigeons that we've been breeding in the church halls while they haven't been in use. Yep. Well, let God have the final word today as you hear his word. The Apostle Peter writes, Christian believers, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Well, why not say the words of the grace with me? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.